Thank you, Richard. Th thanks for inviting me along. Good afternoon to you all. My name is Kevin Jones. I work for Aggregate Industries. Um, I've been in the extractives industry for about 38 years. Most probably some of you are saying it's time you packed it in then, isn't it? Uh, and for those 16 of those years, I've been with Aggregate Industries. Um, and uh, for my sins, I'm sort of a member of the Mineral Products Qualification Council. Uh, I'm chair of the MPQC uh, Training Education Committee. Uh, and I'm also chair of the MPQC Quality Management Committee. Um, so uh, no wonder I'm here because <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I ask for it really. <laughs> Um, but I, I'm honoured to be here and, I, and I'd like to share some of the things that I expressed uh, with, with some of the senior management in the industry at the annual conference last year. No one can deny what a difficult position Europe is in at the moment. Four years of annual growth have been wiped out. Unemployment has risen to double digits. Yes, recovery has begun. But while countries like India, Brazil and China are steaming ahead, in Europe the drag on growth has persisted. Indeed, Europe's share of world output is projected to fall by just under a third in the next two decades. And no one is... And higher than the committee expected three months ago. That mainly reflects further sharp increases in commodity and import prices in the past three months. Gas and oil prices have risen by over 15% and food prices by about 20%. We'll, we'll stop Mervy King there because he's depressing me already. <laughs> but I don't have to tell you people how bad it is. You all know that yourselves. Yeah, you know, it's serious and it's not looking as it's going to get any better fairly quickly. And there are likely to be some challenging times ahead for us all. Low sales volumes, constraints on expenditure, headcount reductions. Yeah. I was actually quite surprised to find and hear Richard say that, you know, we've got about 130, 140 here uh, and down at uh, Chesterfield we're going to have, you know, almost a similar number. Probably which, more. Probably more. And that's quite encouraging really. Yeah, c considering, you know, we're all losing headcount all over the place. And as with all business functions, training initiatives also need to be justified. You know, one of the first things that normally go is the training department, along with the training people. You know, it's, it's well known that get rid of the training people, they're an overhead and we can do without them in difficult times. But thankfully, not all people think like that. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's why I'm here really to talk about training with a return on investment. Because I firmly believe that we can make training pay for itself. Yeah, and thankfully, aggregate industries recognise there are opportunities for integrated training initiatives. They were not exclusive to health and safety issues. Now, you know, we'll come back to health and safety, paramount uh, in, the, you know, in the training that we do. But initiatives that would align with our oper operational training roadmap while encompassing knowledge training, performance assessment, culminating in quantifiable return on investment. So what's our approach to training to achieve this return on investment? We really ask ourselves, what is our training vision? What is the real purpose of training? And what's the strategy? So if I can share with you my training triangle, I had a job finding a triangle on the internet to put on this slide, so I had to use, I had to use something else. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we ask ourselves when it comes to training, what is our vision? And really our vision aligns with the corporate vision as well. Health and safety compliance and improvements, achieving the budgeted forecast and preparing for the midterm. The purpose, why are we doing it? We have to achieve zero harm. We all have to believe in zero harm that it is achievable. 
We need to be compliant. We need desperately to upskill our workforce. That's a key area that I'm very keen on, on upskilling uh, and getting our workforce multitasking, especially in these difficult times. And obviously to culminate in a competent workforce. So what's the strategy to achieving that? Resources. We need to look at what resources we have in-house to be able to deliver that, whether they be financial resources or people resources. Business buy-in. We have to get the business buying into what we are trying to do in terms of training. Get the directors involved. Carry out assessments. From those assessments, we will identify gaps and remedy those gaps through targeted training. And I say targeted training. Don't get me wrong here. NEBOS courses are great. And in our organisation, people would put their hand up to go on a NEBOS course because it meant a fortnight away. And nobody would question, why does this person need to go on a NEBOS course? What's this person going to get out of the NEBOS course? And what's the person going to bring back to the business? Now, don't get me wrong, absolutely nothing wrong with the NEBOS courses. They're quality courses and there's a lot of knowledge within those courses. But you have to ask, how much do they contribute towards competence? But I'm not running NEBOS courses down at all. <clears throat> Industry-focused training. The extractive mineral processing industry focused on legislative compliance training, and quite rightly so. Supported by the industry group such as the MPA, the IOQ, British Aggregate, Association Pro Skills, who used to be the Sector Skills Council for our sector, which unfortunately they no longer are. MPQC, Mineral Products Qualification Council, their awarding organisation and skill centre. All contribute towards legislative compliance training in our sector. And this is well recognised, you know, Roy said it uh, in his talk that you, as a sector, have made enormous strides, you know, over the last 12 years or so in getting to where you are. Yeah. yeah. But there's further work. And the further work involves maintaining the standards and working towards zero harm. <clears throat> Negating personal pain, suffering and loss to our employees, contractors, third-party workers, and, of course, their families. And we mustn't forget the commercial aspects of having an incident or an accident in terms of costly fines, compensations and legal fees. But although these are strong, extremely strong drivers, training should not be focused solely on compliance. What I'm trying to say here is I think we've been putting training too much in a pigeonhole. I feel the training should be a part, an integral part, or health and safety training rather, should be an integral part of what we do as a business and not have it as a standalone issue, especially when it comes to training it out. <clears throat> Mike alluded to things like this, you know, I hope you're all aware of uh, the HSE SIM document there, which gives guidance in respect of competence within the quarrying sector. Uh, and again, Mike alluded to the letter here from Dr. Phil Smith back in January 2011, when asked by the MPA, what does a fully competent assured industry look like? And that was Phil's response. And I'm sure he consulted quite a bit with his colleagues over there uh, as to what in his letter. Did he not, Richard? We, we had some input, but it was higher than us. Phil went higher than us. But, you know, the extraction I've pulled out of the letter there you know, it's, it's fairly clear in that an opera must have defined the competence required for every employee, every employee, identified any gaps in the individual's competence, 
So there's a process here of identifying the gaps. So we have to ask, what is that process that we're adopting to identify gaps? <coughs> and demonstrate that they're actively working to fill those gaps. Yeah. And as, again, Mike alluded to, the, the assessment yeah, and achievement must be uh, aligned with national occupational standards. I'm sure most of you know what NOSs are, as they're called. You know, they are standards. They're in every sector. There are standards for engineering. We've got standards for the extractive sector. And there are standards for specific activities and roles within that sector as well. So our assessment methods must align with the NOS. And not to forget the strong message that Mike was trying to put out before me in terms of keeping and demonstrating CPD. <clears throat> I've got a better map than you. That's a better picture than yours, Mike. I can flog you that. <laughs> um, can I ask, how many of you are aware of the MPA CIFA by competence policy and have seen that? Hands up, please. Not everybody. Quite a number are not aware of, of that. So this is one of the drivers that we've got at the moment. You know, all, I am told, I didn't attend the board meeting myself, but I am told that all the great and the good of our organisation went there and stuck their hand up in the air or kept them down, whatever. The, the <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, I, I, and I, I sometimes hope that you know, they all understand the significance of that, because Mike mentioned it, there are some challenges up here, real challenges for us. You know, I'll go to the next slide, because I've drawn where we're supposed to be at the moment, because that relates to the quarrying sector. You know, and on the targets achieved, um, we should be there. We should have signed everybody up and on the engagement rather, sorry, on the left, and on the achieved, yeah, for management and supervision, we should have all been there by June this year. As Mike said, we're not, are we? Uh, and again, we need to get all our operatives and maintenance people all signed up, particularly boo, by June 2014. But I've not mentioned those people there, where there are real challenges on getting those people on board, and we haven't even considered these people down here who are non-quarrying people, but we've got a not, lot of non-quarrying people in our businesses, in the asphalt business, the ready mix, the concrete products business, contracting business. Like Mike said, it's a big, big challenge, this one. So I'll move on. Again, um, QCF. Yeah. All familiar with QCF now, are we? <laughs> yeah. Forget NBQs. Everybody knows about QCF. Yeah. <clears throat> Just in case we don't know much about QCF, I will spend two minutes for you. Two minutes on QCF. Yeah. Or I can skip it. If you all know about QCF, I'll skip it. Yeah. <laughs> I come across a lot of people who ask me, what, pardon, uh, <laughs> when I mention QCFs. QCFs are the new format of assessment qualifications, England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Yeah. They replace the national qualification framework, the framework on which the NVQs were accredited yeah, as the new standard of vocational qualification. Scotland have their own new Framework SCQF, Scottish Credit and Qualification Framework. And when I was up in Glasgow recently talking to them, uh, they're not very keen on that one either, because they've decided to stick to their old SVQs, which they like very much. Yeah, and good for them. Uh, but please, currently held NVQs are still valid to conform, confirm competence in an occupation role to the standard required. So please... Do not go out and burn your NVQs. Yeah, they're perfectly valid and will continue to do so, provided 
you know, you're, you're, you're demonstrating competence in that particular role that you got your NBQ in. So, right. so NBQs are still okay. And if anybody tries to flog you a QCF saying, oh, you need to upgrade your NBQ to a QCF now, and provided you haven't changed your role, you can tell them where to go. Right. What do these QCF looks like, look like? Yeah, let's look at the structure. Unlike NVQs, QCF are structured as building blocks known as units. Units can be combined together through what they call a rule of combination, a rock, to form a qualification. That's one of the beauties of it, in that you can pick units yeah, from all over the place. Yeah, there are units which are generated, written, put on a database, from various organisations. And some of the units that we use within the extractive sector, we will pinch from CEMTA. CEMTA is an SSE, yeah, and, but it's linked to the engineering sector. And the great and the good within CEMTA have written some QCFs of their own, yeah, relating to engineering. Now, we have engineering within our sector, quite a lot of it. <laughs> uh, so, therefore, we can go and pinch some units. Uh, Mike, Mike and I sat on a working group recently and we've developed um, some QCFs for our maintenance personnel yeah, and for maintenance supervisors. And although we put some core extractives units in there, we also went and pinched some centre units because we wanted to put some engineering in there and we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Yeah, and we end up with quite a nice little qualification to demonstrate competency or fitness in our, in our industry. And that's how it works. Now, and we'll see more of this as things progress and move on. <clears throat> right, qualification can be structured to have mandatory units, <coughs> units that the <coughs> learner, we call them learners, yeah, have to do, optional units, things that they might want to do if the activity is there. I'll give you an example. Somebody on a plant, um, some plants, let's say a ready-mix plant, has a loading shovel. Others don't. They put material straight into a ground hoppers and feed them into the plant. Now, you can't go asking an operative on a ready-mix plant without a loading shovel, which doesn't have one, to do an unit on loading shovel. Uh, because he says, don't know what you're talking about, mate. Never driven one, never seen one. That means he couldn't achieve the qualification because you have to achieve all the mandatory units. So you've got to put some options in there. And additional units, like you would say, well, one of the guys does a bit of welding. You know, we can add on a welding unit or something if we need. We also have to have pathways. Now, why do you need pathways to complicate things? Well, Many of you guys know quite a bit about asphalt, I'm sure, don't you? Asphalt used to be a, a fair part of our business at one time. Yeah? And some of you had batching plants, and others of you had drum mix plants. If you go to West Drayton, they've got both. Yeah? But that's why you've got to have pathways. So the guys on the batching plant would do pathway one, and the guys on the drum mix plant would do pathway two which would be applicable to their roles and activities. Yeah. So qualifications have levels, size, and credit value. This is simple, this, isn't it? Yeah. Every unit in qualification has a level, and level indicates difficulty. And it varies from entry at level one to level eight. There are three qualification types an award, up to 12 credits, certificates, up to 36 credits, and diplomas, at 37 credits or more. Yeah. You can have an award of any difficulty level from one to eight. This is because the type indicates the size of qualification, not <coughs> its difficulty. Every unit in qualification has a credit value, and these credit values now um, sort of build up into, there is a national database being built, 
where, where the youngsters will have an in, unique number and they will log and record their credit values on there. So you can build up credit values. You know, if you, if you go to Derby University to do a diploma in there, you know, for each of the modules that are coming out, you'll get credit values and you can build your diploma up and then add those credits to go on to do a, a degree. Uh, and to understand the levels, a lot of controversy about this. DCSEs, grades A to C, yeah, are about level two. A levels around level three. And up at the top at level eight, it's about the PhD level. A lot of people argue about that one. So there you go. There's your lesson in QCF. And really, there's not a lot more you need to know about QCF, to be honest. So training to meet the challenge. <clears throat> Some of you might have heard about the strategy for sustainable construction. This brought to the fore the future intention of government and set challenging targets. Yeah. These are somewhat similar yeah, and do align with national occupational standards. Aggregate industries recognise the need to upskill its operational staff to meet these challenges, but the need appeared greater within our added value businesses that are high impact manufacturing processes. You know, we recognised we hadn't done as much within our added value businesses of asphalt, ready mixed concrete, concrete products that we had within, within our calling sector. Now, interpreting the uh, strategy for sustainable construction in its various categories identified the need not only to train out and assess higher health and safety standards, but also site efficiencies which improve plant operation, production plant understanding, relevance of plant maintenance to reduce breakdowns, product quality and technical appreciation, environmental impact of issues, energy and carbon management. And let's not forget customer expectation and satisfaction. <clears throat> Those are the things that some of the added value business directors were telling me that was lacking within our qualifications and the assessments that we were doing. Nobody was suggesting we, sh we abandon health and safety and environmental issues at all. But they were saying, where is the production plant understanding? What are we doing about plant maintenance and making our people understand you know, how important it is to keep our plants well maintained. Yeah. Do they understand the quality of the products that they are really producing? Or are they just pressing buttons and hope that what falls into the truck is okay? The example that I'd like to give you is what we did within our Bad Nashfield uh, business. As mentioned, uh, the, the management there asked me to have a look to see what we could do in the way of qualifications that would identify gaps within the workforce, both operative, supervisory and managerial level, and what we could do to fill those gaps with some training initiatives in order to achieve at a point where those people can fully demonstrate competence. Uh, and align with requirements of the MPA and the HSE guidance uh, um, standards um, re required there. So we ended up writing our own qualifications. Um, we wrote our own because we wanted to introduce these points about production, technical, quality, customer service into the qualification as well. So I'm going to list three qualifications here. A level one diploma in Asheville production with 60 credits. We produced a level one because we thought about apprentices and people joining our business to give them some form of foot on the ladder type qualification. The level two diploma is geared towards uh, our operatives Mostly skilled operatives um, would attempt the level two, and that's got 96 credits. And the level four, 
we wrote for our supervisory and some managerial people, especially the managerial people who were, were, were not or hadn't achieved things like the she. And that's quite a large qualification with 137 credits. But you can't just write a qualification uh, and that's it. You just use it. You've got to get it accredited. So we trotted along to ProSkills, who were, as I mentioned, the Sector Skills Council for our sector. And through their qualification reform group, they approved it. Um, and it was uh, accredited also through the Industry Awarding Organisation, MPQC. Uh, and we take these new qualifications now through the MPQC Training and Education Committee. Yeah. And of course, everything that goes through there goes to the industry board uh, and they endorse it as well. They end up on a database, a national database, which you can all access off the internet. It's the Ofcol database, which is the Office of Qualification Examination Regulation, Ofcol and they're up on their database. Quite easy to access, actually. And we made these qualifications that we developed open status. We didn't have to make them open. We could have kept them ourselves to aggregate industries and only used them ourselves. But we made them open because, really, for the great and the good of the industry, it allowed everybody who wanted to take these qualifications and use them for their own benefits as well. So they're open status, anybody can use them. That's a screenshot of the Ofcol database. And it's quite simple, you just type in Ofcol register, it's the register of regulated qualifications. You end up with that screen, and up the top there, it said select qualification. You click that, either put in the numbers uh, that I referenced there, or you can search on MPQC, and you can type the word in off, uh, asphalt or something, and it'll bring up these qualifications, a number of them. Now, I mentioned that we developed a level two diploma. There are a number of units. I know you can't really read those, and neither can I, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, normally, ha normally have something in front of me here, I should. Uh, yes, I know. Uh, right, I'm going to... Asphalt plant operation. Operation of the burner. Material temperature. Control of binders. A few more. Principles of asphalt, asphalt carriageway construction. Environmental control. There are about 50 plus mandatory units there within the qualification. And pathways. A few more, like carbon management. And again, aligning with the strategy for sustainable construction. Yeah, dealing with X-Works customers and delivery vehicles. Material weighing and mixing. And within those qualifications, within those units, each unit is a qualification in its own right, actually. Health and safety improvements, site efficiency, which improve plant operation, production plant understanding, relevance of plant maintenance to reduce breakdowns, product quality and technical appreciation, environmental impact and issues, energy and carbon management, customer expectation and satisfaction. Keep going. We're, we're okay, aren't we, Richard? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Just keep going. Yeah. We're well ahead of time, aren't we? Okay. So you can pan it out. Yeah. Sing yeah. us a song or something. Yeah. We, we, we can have an interval and yeah. uh, go to the bar for yeah. 10 minutes or something. <laughs> <laughs> Customer expectation. Yeah. Key issue. Yeah. It's changed quite a lot in that the way our customers measure our product quality and performance has changed considerably in recent years. An example of this is the way the Highway Agency stipulates pavement quality. Not at the point of delivery and laying anymore, but in the durability of the surfaces where finishes produced 
at site at situ against contracted parameters. So, you know, you, you don't get paid up front, you get paid as you go along, depending uh, on, on how well the carriageway performs. So, in order to meet those, yeah, we need to have a bit of a look into the qualification itself. Uh, we've got material temperature, and as you can see, each qualification has learning outcomes and assessment criterion. Don't know where they got the word criterion from, I just say assessment criteria. Yeah. And I'll bring up some of those assessment criteria in a minute. But if we look at that, the 20 ton load of asphalt, obviously we got binder separation. Yeah. So, yeah, like <laughs> self-leveling asphalt. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I apologise I've come to you with an asphalt example but this can apply in ready mixed concrete this can apply in quarries you know the principles of what I'm saying to you you know it's exactly the same within quarries and the training you do in quarries with your plant operation or process op qualifications exactly the same but uh, we, we, we could debate what is the real cause of that. It doesn't really matter. It's a process failure, isn't it? Somebody back at the farm got it wrong, didn't they? Yeah. And that's the key thing. Yeah. Because there is a cost to that. Yeah. And cost means a hell of a lot these days. Yeah. That load is to be tipped. Yeah. Oh, and people put their hands up. Oh, no, no, we can recycle it. Wrap and all this. Yeah. But recycling costs money. You know, mobile crushers in every now and then to attack that big black heap you've got at the back of the quarry. Yeah. Yeah, it costs money to recrush this, this stuff and reprocess it and feed it back in. <clears throat> so let's have a, a quick look at the cost of something like this. Now, <coughs> let's not debate the actual unit costs I've got here um, because I've tried to put some nominal figures to cover the whole business you know, averaging across businesses with sites ranging from large modern plants to small urban plants. But the return haulage and that would be about three quid. The original haulage, say, was six quid. Stone, 15 pound. Bitumen, 30 pound. Electricity, 40p. The fuel, four pound. Fuel tax, 40p. R&M, labour costs, about three pound 20. Whoa, there we go, 62 quid. Yeah. Per ten. On that load, over 1,200 quid being tipped. Can we afford in this day and age to throw away 1,200 pound? And that happens, I know it happens quite a lot. That's not the end of it really, because it's all this remedial work. Yeah. You've got to lift the material, the delays, the penalties, your reputation, legal action, lost business, some additional costs, God forbid, it's a sports arena you're having to pick up, or some tennis courts with having been, had some fancy colours and additives put into it, and you're having to pick that up as well. It gets extremely costly. And that doesn't look terribly good anyway, does it? You know, and, you know, we, we're giving away real stone there. <laughs> so... This kind of stuff, stuff is, is, isn't on, really, is it? You know, this is not where we need to be. Totally unacceptable. And that's what the qualification is there to address. Like on this unit here. Yeah. Housekeeping and spillage. And you say, well, what do you want to bother about housekeeping and spillage for? It's very basic stuff, this, isn't it? You know, housekeeping. You know, do we really want a QCF in housekeeping and spillage? And the assessment criteria is asking, describe the adopted practices that limit the occurrence of spillage. Now, that is the question that would have been asked the learner, who is a plant operative, when he's doing the QCF. What practices have you got on your site that limit the occurrence of spillage? 
and we'd expect him to know the answer to that and we would record it as evidence and log it with pictures or voice recording or some, some further evidence. We'd like to see things like this being said. Oh, on our converse, we've got some skirting rubbers and I make damn sure that that rubber is touching the belt because we can adjust them up and down a bit so there's no spillage. And we've also got a scraper on the return conveyor to scrape off the, the material off the belt as it's returning, starting to return. That's the kind of thing we're looking for. And not something like that, where there is a considerable gap between the rubber there and the conveyor belt there, and that material will be spilling out onto the floor. And we say, oh, that's not that critical, is it? It certainly is critical. These are the things that stop us making money and cause accidents. Another unit, introduction. Perform a normal breakdown operation. Sorry about the, uh, the misalignment of things. Uh, I wrote it in PowerPoint 2010 or something and we're, we're leaning on 2003 here so the, some of the, the writing's gone a bit all over the place but we can live with that, can't we? Perform a normal shutdown operation. Is it important to shut down the process appropriately? Nice little picture there, tail drum. I don't think uh, our colleagues would find much wrong in terms of the, the quality of the guarding there. there there's don't go down, low Sorry? Don't go down. Low don't go down, there we go, yeah. Uh, you know, local isolation, you've got some nice grease pipes there. But more importantly, there's a nice pile of spillage there as well, isn't there? Yeah. Now, that spillage, if it's the middle of winter, <coughs> and that spillage is normally damp and wet in the winter time, it will freeze at night. And come six o'clock in the morning, when that button gets pressed to send the conveyor on its way, yeah, you hear a click in the panel, the trip's gone. So you have another go at resetting the trip and it goes again. Yeah. Next time it goes bang and the fuse is gone now. We're not having much fun here. So we better do something about clearing that spillage. So come on, you know, good boys, we're well trained. Isolation, lock off, yeah. get some shovels out, get some spanners, take the guard off, remove the grease pipes because they're a bit in the way and let's start shoveling and we can't leave it there so go and get a wheelbarrow and we'll stick it in there. Yeah, well, we started at 6, it's 7.30 now yeah, and there's an irritable customer out there on the M1 waiting for his material. Yeah. Frantic phone calls to the centre saying, can you switch this somewhere else? Another site who's up to here already and had managed to fire up is saying, all kinds of obscenities about being landed with some additional load first thing in the morning. Yeah. So inspection is all important, isn't it? Yeah. To identify things like that. Housekeeping is very important. And greasing. Similarly, yeah, you've been working hard on your Asheville plant, plant on, on, a, on a, uh, let's say, a Sunday afternoon. And Newcastle are playing on the telly in the afternoon. And you're dying to get away. And it's winter time because we don't play football in the summer, do we? Yeah. Um, and you don't bother clearing the bitumen lines down. And come Monday morning at six o'clock, uh, when something's gone wrong with the electricity and the trace heating's failed and your bitumen lines are full of solid bitumen. Yeah. Again, not bothering applying a bit of skip release agent to the... To, to the, to the door above the skip there again the door won't open in the mornings yeah simply because somebody couldn't be bothered to put a little bit of release agent there yeah. Yeah. perform a normal shutdown operation that's the kind of thing we expect yeah from our operatives yeah, when they're challenged with doing this qualification and as I said it leads to starter problems the following day. This is an example that one 
of the Ashfield operatives, uh, operational managers gave me. He said, I visited a site with one of the Ashfield assessors, yeah, and saw that things weren't really right on the burner. They didn't have the burner set up properly. Let's say the average fuel cost is 50p a litre. Yeah. They managed to achieve uh, a consumption reduction from 14 to 12 litres a tonne, following the assessment and further training of, of the operative there. Yeah. A saving, it's only two litres per tonne, but that's a pound. That plant was doing 50,000 tonnes a year at 50,000 pounds. 50,000 pounds on one plant is not to be stiffed at. Yeah. It's bottom line profit, remember. All the costs have been incurred. Yeah. So that goes on the profit line. Operation of the filtration system. Describe the features of an efficient filtration system. A lot of people get this wrong. They don't know what happens inside that box. They see on the gauge abnormally high filtration system pressure. They don't really know what it's saying. Ah, it's all right, it's always been like that. It drifts, you know, a bit. It's, it's, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Still running. Yeah. We'll worry about it when it stops. Yeah. But they don't appreciate that you get reduced production rate. Your electricity consumption goes up. Your fuel usage goes up. There's an impact on material quality. You're damaging your filter bags. Yeah. Remedial downtime will occur. Environmental discharge because the stuff going up the stock is not acceptable. Not to mention at some point someone has to go in there and we're talking about confined spaces, aren't we? And everything that's to go with confined spaces in terms of the increased risk and the training or the lack of training that people have to go in there. So little things cost money, lots of money. So we need to try and make sure we are getting it right. The qualification we deliver is split up into knowledge units where we have designed workbooks. There are three of them there, health and safety and environment, processing, customer service, and performance, yeah, the in-house assessment programme itself. The, the, the workbooks um, have a lot of information and knowledge in them and at the end of each section there is a little sort of test that they have to complete. Now, that's enough about Ashfelt. I'd just like to say to you, we've not only done it in Ashfelt, we've done it in ready mix concrete as well. So there are two qualifications, again level two diploma in ready mix concrete and a level four diploma in a mix concrete um, for sort of supervisory people. So exactly the same thing. Uh, it's a mirror image almost where we, we've changed the word asphalt into concrete and okay, we don't talk about bitumen, but we talk about cement and things like that. So we've done it in ready mix concrete as well. And they're of an open status also. Something else we do, we We've teamed up with Ashon Hill Management College and all our frontline managers, especially the operational ones, attend a level three certificate in first line management. And on that program, we, we ran three programs last year um, and there are, uh, there are 48 people on that. They, they attend there on three occasions. It's a two day residential and we do outside activities and things. Uh, running five programmes this year, we, we, we were just about to start the last programme of, of 2012. So we've got another 80 managers on it this year. Uh, and it's got leadership in health and safety, performance management and business improvement. Um, and we, we, we ask uh, an EXCO director to go along and lead it. So we got sort of buy-in here. Uh, and, and they have to go away, visit other sites and, and, and look for health and safety improvements that they can take back to their own site. They also have to do a return on investment project and they have to present that to us and it has to be a real one. 
You know, not a toy one where you say, oh yeah, you might make a bit of money out of this. Um, and the return on investment for the three cohorts that ran last year was about 190,000. That average is just under 4,000 per candidate. That's real money. If I extend that for the whole programme of 128 candidates, yeah, we'll have returned over half a million. But you say, ah, yeah, but how much did the course cost you? I'll tell you, just under 1,700 quid per head. And my mental arithmetic tells me that 128 times just under 1,700 is just over 200,000. So I still pocketed 300,000 quid. Something you're off able to offer the business back. So when you go knocking on the door of your CEO and say, I want to do this training program, it'll bring us some real benefit. And you'll say, what kind of benefit? And you'll say, oh, you know, it, we'll be better at health and safety, won't we? We'll be better at this, we'll be better at that. Once you start talking money to them and start telling them it's not going to cost you, in fact, yeah, I can make some money out of this, yeah, because we'll get our people really engaged on returning some investment back into the business. Now, you all do a bit of this, don't you? Yeah, mobile plant training. So there are opportunities here as well. Yeah. We've now got the new plant operator competence scheme. Yeah. It aligns with the sector NOS, National Occupational Standards, and within a QCF, because there's a QCF attached to it, incorporates knowledge and practical training. It's accredited by the Extractive Mineral Processing Industry Awarding Organisation, MPQC. I, I hope you're all up to speed on this. You know, it's got the red card, it's got the blue card, yeah, and it incorporates a QCF as, as part of the package as well. So again, if you're trying to sell this one to the uh, director and say, we really need to get on board with this boss, you know, start thinking and saying, how can I sell this one to the boss? Now, you all have got a lot of evaluation or monitoring procedures in place. Key performance indicators, you count cycle times, plant stoppage times. Most of you know what OE is about these days. Fuel usage, tyre wear, r &M costs, health and safety, lost time injury frequency rate, incident reports, environmental complaints. Get your operatives involved through the setting of objectives during annual job review or appraisals, whatever you call them. Get the workers involved in this. And also, build return on investment elements into the contractual arrangements that you've got with a training provider, whether they be MPQC Skill Centre or Mentor or whoever you use. I'm only aware of those two people that are actually allowed to run the MPQC CAD system. But get them involved and say, what am I going to get back? I'm already talking to both those people about incorporating a scheme attached to the training where they have to demonstrate to me, because I will give them the data, that the training that they're giving our operatives is going to return something. Now, whether it returns better LTIs or better tyre wear or better fuel usage or a combination of them, but I want something back from the money I'm spending with them on their training. But when we're looking at things globally, all the training things we do, there are even more key performance indicators that we can use to measure the improvement. Many of you will be able to say, oh, we do that. You know, we do return loads analysis. We record, we've got some ta uh, lab test results. We do OEE. We know what fuel usage per ton we've got or our electricity consumption. We keep records of our plant r &M. Use that data and then measure the improvement over a period of time in the various areas that you've identified 
uh, that you can measure with. So, let me just take you back. You're nearly there, Richard. All right. Are we all right? I'm yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, they've, they've put their hands up at the back there. Have they? Right. Yeah. Nearly there. Just, just go back to the cost uh, of that load of asphalt. Yeah. Take out the haulage and things, we got £53 of a cost there. Yeah. Let me go back a minute. £53. Right. Cost of production of £53. If, who would agree with me that we could, through the training and assessment, achieve a 10% improvement? Or a 5% improvement? A 1% improvement? But I would settle for half a percent. That makes a saving of 26.5p per tonne. Major producers on average output about 5 million tonnes annually. That's 5 million tonnes at 26.5p, 1.32 million. That's on the bottom line. You don't need any capital investments to get that. You just get your people working more efficiently, yeah, understanding what they're doing. Yeah, and they will return you some serious, serious results. And over the whole country, the UK asphalt production was about 21 plus million tonnes in 2010, a potential saving of just under 6 million for the whole of the industry. If we were only measuring at half a percent of an improvement, half a percent, what if you achieved 1%? You'd double that, wouldn't you? If I go back to my triangle, yeah, we explained the strategy to you, and that brought us integrated training and assessment initiatives. The purpose was to upskill our people yeah, and achieve a competent workforce, achieving our vision and returning a quantifiable return on investment. Thank you all. <coughs> Thank you very much, Evan. Uh, now you know why I included this talk in this uh, conference, because it was very riveting when I listened to it down at the uh, annual general meeting. Are there any questions, Preffin? Or have you been bombarded into submission? <laughs> do, you, do you have uh, internal assessors go around and look at uh, people's work on it? these modules? Uh, yeah. No. Um, we did have, within aggregate industries, um, about eight internal assessors at one time, which unfortunately we lost. Uh, one of them is in this room today. Uh, but I convinced the directors in Asphalt that if we were to deliver this qualification, uh, it could only be delivered by people who are what I class as occupationally competent. People who know about the business. When they get the answers, they know they're the right one. The, when the guy is asking, now tell me how that dust collector works, yeah, he's able to interpret the inter information that's coming back to him from an operative. Yeah, that, yeah he's saying the right things. Yeah. And we have got two assessors in Asphalt. Um, uh, both of them are ex-Asphalt plant managers. Yeah. So, yeah, we've got two. We, we, we are developing more people, actually. We've got another couple in the pipeline. And I've got myself a very occupationally competent uh, chap who works for me as our internal verifier, because we need a competent internal verifier as well. Uh, and because I had retained our own aggregate industries um, approved NVQ stroke QCF centre. So we we've got a structure in place to deliver this as well. And that's the other part. But there's nothing stopping people going to a provider. And I'm a firm believer. Yeah, you know, I can tell you how useless NVQs are for the next half hour, if you like. Yeah, because I have seen some useless NVQ assessing done over the years by a, a range of people. I've also seen some excellent NVQs carried out over the years. Yeah. 
because it's all down to the assessor that's doing it and the organisation that person works for, really. NVQs are very much a feature of who is delivering it. Yes. Yeah. I know there are standards, yeah, and the awarding organisations have their external verifiers, yeah, but there has been a variance, in my opinion, of, of, of uh, delivery yeah, w w within vocational qualifications. But I do think they're getting better. I'd like to think that the work we are trying to do, and that's why I, I have strong feelings on, on these things, that's why I try and get involved with the um, awarding organisation committees and things like that to try and make sure that we are delivering the right standards. Yeah. Cause I, I honestly feel you know, we, we've got to do, make sure we're delivering quality uh, qualifications. Well, thank you very much, Evan. No, oh, sorry. sorry. <coughs> one, one more question, sorry. You've had one. Uh, Am I allowed to have two? No. <laughs> <laughs> Lunch uh, is ready. <laughs> well, you've got four minutes. Uh, very quick one. Um, coming back to the QCF, um, and we were talking about all the, the various modules and the levels. Um, when I did my MDQ, uh, I did an MDQ level four, uh, I asked about upgrading that to a level five, uh, and I was told that you basically had to. Uh, virtually start again from yeah. scratch. If you hold qualification uh, at the start of current MVQ, can you bolt modules on to extend that to a higher level through the QCF? I mean, are they, are they, are they transferable? I, I know what you're asking, Simon. The real answer is yes and no. You know, I, <laughs> yeah. That it depends. really depends what the qualification is yeah, and how the qualification is structured. Yeah. There was an intention to, to do that and some of the qualifications can do that because you can sort of have certain units and you can top up. Yeah. There is an element, an element within the QCF that allows you to do that, you know, to, to, to do topping up sort of thing. It's, let me put it like this. It's easier through the QCF to do what you'd like to do than it was under the old NVQ. Easier. Yeah. I'm not saying it's just like that, but it's easier. Yeah. Would you want to ask a question, Ron? Yeah. I was just going to ask Kevin, have, have the, um, the level four levels changed over the years? Have you been doing it for long enough to know that you've got that the asphalt figure, yeah, um, it, the real answer is no, because we're in early days. Uh, we, we've done, we've claimed certifications for um, 32 people in the asphalt uh, business, and we've registered the next 32, the next cohort. So we're on the journey there. Yeah? The, the, the management one, we know the figures, yeah? the true figures, um, and we have within our asphalt and concrete businesses what they call business improvement teams. And they're very much monitoring yeah, the improvements because that's what their job is. You know, uh, you know, they're justifying their existence, these people, in the business improvement team to see are they moving forward and getting a, the, these returns they're looking for. You know, my part of it is just looking to see how do I contribute towards return on investment through training and qualifications. Yes, you know. the, um, the, the, the one thing that I feel that is measurable, yeah, um, there, there are lots of health and safety people here, um, uh, some of them sort of ex-AI people as well, and they, might, <laughs> <laughs> and they might not agree with me, but you know, when we had lost time injury frequency rate figures which were way way up there you know around the year 2000 in the teens shall we say you know and you know I haven't put a graph up but we, we know how the curve comes down you know and many organizations now find themselves down quite low don't they and there's a bit of leveling out happening now isn't there you know and many are down in the ones below ones you know half yeah now, there were easy wins at the start, weren't there? You know, if you said, right, introduce isolation and lock-off, yeah, 
you've got a winner, haven't you, straight away. We'll stop killing people by doing that. Yeah. And then you say, what else can we do? Let's improve our guarding standards. Yeah. You know, like Richard said, make sure all the guards are down to the floor and properly bolted. No more cable ties and bits of wire and things like that and quick release latches. And, yeah. So that will bring us you know, more improvement. Yeah. And then somebody would say, what, el what else can we do for an easy win? You know, and, and the, you know, there, there are lots of some easy wins that you can get. You say, oh, you know, transport, biggest problem we've got, isn't it? Transport, what can we do about that? Well, let's segregate the people from the transport, pedestrianised walkway. Everywhere you go now, we've got lovely walkways, really, haven't we, around sites. Yeah. So you can, you know, the curb comes down very quickly. But once you get to that lower level and you're plateauing out, yeah, what are you going to do next? You know, you can't look at your garden, your garden's okay. Your pedestrianised walkways are fine. You know, the armco barriers will last longer than the bloody quarry. <laughs> <laughs> so everything is working tickety-boo. I firmly believe it's things and initiatives like this that will drive that figure from the ones and the halves down to the zero ham because it's people. That's the only area we need to concentrate now, yeah, is the people. We still have to maintain all the other things. We don't forget about the guarding and the lock-off and things like that, but people, yeah, and, 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 and that's the real measure, Roy, in answer to your question, yeah. I, I think yeah, if we were measuring properly, yeah, lost time injury, frequency rates and things like that, and concentrating with people through initiatives like NVQs, QCFs, to get people upskilled and competent in what they do, we will get down to that zero half. I agree with you entirely that people will deliver the targets here. Now, I just simply wondered whether you'd actually been doing it long enough to, to know whether you were getting that return on investment. I mean, I agree entirely with you that, that um, it is the way to go. It is going to be people that can deliver what we want. Um, and I think that I'm fairly convinced that the figures will be there. I just wonder if you've been doing long enough to, to, to happen. Small amounts in small areas that, that, that we're seeing improvements. We, in the Asheville boys are telling me there are significant improvements in fuel usage. Significant improvement in fuel usage. Thank you.